I think if you believe that things could be good and people are good and um, radiant, then they are. The time has now come for, for the people around the world that are really doing remarkable things to just put everything aside and just come together. We rely too much on mechanical things and things outside ourselves and I think we should spend a little bit more time strengthening our own abilities to connect with people. They make a big issue about how to live life. It's so, so simple, you know, just be kind to yourself, be kind to other people, be kind to the environment. I mean, it's, it's easy peasy, but you've just got to do it. Hi, I'm Amisha and this is episode six of the Future is Beautiful podcast. Thank you for all your comments, reviews and messages. It's so wonderful that what we are sharing here is hitting a nerve and that it's inspiring, encouraging and uplifting you. This week it's time for another amazing woman, Zabanu Gifford. I met Zabanu recently when I was visiting the Asher Centre in the Forest of Dean. I was struck by the beauty of the place and the care that you could feel running through every part of the centre. I spent an entire day with Zabanu hearing her incredible stories of a lifetime of challenging the system, courageous activism, and creating a centre for peace. I hope that you enjoy this interview and she wakes up more of your courage. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. I'm delighted to be here today at the Asher Center in the Forest of Dean, joined by Zarbanu Gifford, who is the founder of this incredible space. And from everything that I've taken in from being here, um, an incredible activist and force for change in the world. Welcome. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start by um, hearing a little bit about what made you want to set up this center. Goodness, I'm always asked that, and I really can't give you an answer because I don't know. It was just always been in me. Um, I've always been rather irritated by hearing politicians and people of my generation talking about um, investing in young people. Um, and the young are our future. And then they make everything as difficult as possible for them. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't actually, they don't inspire them. Um, they always bring everything down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, and I just felt it would be wonderful to have a place. Uh, England is, is very appropriate because everybody wants to speak English and everybody likes to come to England. But a place that was sacred, um, but it didn't belong to any community or group. Because I've been around the world and I've been to some very, very special places but it always belongs to a group of people. And they can be very generous, but you always have to toe their agenda. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be wonderful to have somewhere where people could be free, they could express themselves, um, um, they could be in somewhere that was very, very beautiful. Because I think one of the things that's important in life is beauty. And I think that a, a lot of the world at the moment is very ugly. Mm -hmm. Um, so that to me was very important to be able to lay out gardens and um, places where you could meet in auditoriums, um, an eco lodge, where you could, where you could just be authentic. Um, and I think that's really, I think that's what ASHA is about. And the ASHA Centre, I think, has fulfilled that because we've now had thousands and thousands of young people from all over the world who've come here. Um, I think there's only about two places in the world that we haven't sort of covered. Mm -hmm. And um, every single time they sort of hug me and tell me that they feel as if they're changed. They feel good. And uh, it's just wonderful. 
And the young people come here to volunteer primarily, or they come here for volunteer and courses? They come so for volunteering and for courses, and to meet and to exchange ideas, to come on retreats, um, to learn courses. Um, I think the most exciting for me is when they come and they're in groups and they want to initiate uh, partnerships together to really change the world for better. So mm. it, I think the background and the place itself um, is inducive to making people feel empowered that they can change the world. And I, I really, I just got here two days ago, um, two nights ago, um, here for Conspire, an amazing gathering of, of change makers and facilitators. And, and as soon as I arrived, I noticed something very different about this place. And um, I, I think the invitation, the multicultural invitation of this place, sometimes you go to these English um, country halls, retreat centers, mm. and there's a stuffy feel. And here I felt like there was so much like freedom and thought and openness. And the beauty really struck me. And this podcast is called The Future is Beautiful. What is it that you feel happens to people when they're in a space of beauty? What does beauty invite and open up in people? Oh, um, that's a difficult question because everybody's so unique. Mm. So it's, it, people react differently. But I think what it does is it makes you feel anything is possible and you don't have to live in ugliness you don't have to live in in misery um, I mean I, I just feel that that um, the world should be paradise and there's no reason why we all can't experience paradise on earth I mean that's what we're here to do is to transform the darkness into paradise and um, it comes from my own background, the word paradise, it comes from the Persian Zoroastrian background, where it was um, really a beautiful garden. Um, and I think one of the things we do at Ashes, we allow people in their own way to connect with nature or to reconnect and just to um, experience sometimes silence, to experience great joy and coming together and connecting with other human beings and also giving people a time and space to connect with themselves, just to work out what do they want to do in the world without being pressurized that you've got to do an important job or you've got to be famous or you've got to make money. Mm. You can actually, you can decide yourself what you want. And you realize, I think here, I think a lot of people realize that they are unique and there isn't just a formula that you can give people. This is the formula to be so-called successful or happy or whatever it is. And sometimes it takes a lifetime to realize, you know, what your uh, unique destiny is. And sometimes it comes in a flash. Mm. And uh, I think that's what ASHA is. ASHA just, the ASHA Center just allows people to do it in their own time, but in a beautiful environment. Yeah, I've been really taken by this place and would love to do my own retreats and, and fantastic. things here. And, I think for me, one of the things that's so incredible as well is like as we walked around the land and we met all of the gardeners and they were explaining about how everything's grown in a biodynamic way. And there's just that like appreciation of nature um, in every level of every every part of what I've experienced here. Well, um, I'm told that I'm not needed anymore and, and I'm allowed to come every so often as a hotel inspector to make sure everything <laughs> is beautiful. So um, I'm, I'm now redundant and free to go anywhere in the world and do anything, which is quite a joy at my age. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it's wonderful when I come and I see groups and often, um, you know, I say to our director, Adrian Locker, um, I feel so bad because I'm not here to welcome everybody and uh, get a hug from everybody. <laughs> And he says, you don't have to be Zabanu because in karmic terms, because you've initiated the place and you put your energy and your will into making it happen, um, you, are, you are reaping the karma. Mm. So the happiness that people um, are receiving from coming to the Asha Center um, comes back to you. You don't have to actually be there to witness it. Mm. And that's a lovely feeling. And I, mean, I think your spirit has felt in all over in everything and when mark your son was explaining about the ash center yesterday and he was telling 
you know, and I just went up to him yeah. and was like, I want to meet your mother. Like, I've seen all these clues, like, whether it's the, the pictures on yeah. the walls or the books on the bookshelves. And, and, well, I remember yeah. books on the bookshelf. I remember when I um, donated my library, which is a very fascinating library because I'm, I've met um, some extraordinary people around the world. And um, I have been called a cosmic networker and many people have given me their books. And I, I, I gave them all to the Asher Center Library. And I remember somebody saying to me, there won't be a book left here, it'll all be pinched. And I said, believe me, not a single book will be taken because people feel the energy um, at the center and they will read the books, enjoy it and put it back. And nothing has been stolen. Mm. And I think it's very important to put that energy into the universe where people are welcome to use it. And I always say to everybody, well, if they want it so badly and they take it, well, I'm so happy because they will enjoy it. Mm. And I think that's the attitude we should have. And then uh, I think a lot of um, unhappiness comes about in the world because we put out that energy of fear and um, mistrust and... Um, not believing that things can be good. Mm. I think if you believe that things can be good and people are good and um, radiant, then they are. If you create a space based on love and respect, mm. then people Absolute, they just drop absolutely. into those values. Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is an example, and everybody should come from around the world to see how it works because it's, it's a model mm. of how things work. And um, remarkable, I mean, there's so many young people that have come to Asher and been totally aimless with no purpose in life. And I've spent time with them and I've said to them, you, you will have to um, be accountable for this life. And there will be a day of judgment and you will have to um, review all the goodness all the good thoughts, all the good words, all the good deeds you've done. And you also have to experience all the unhappiness you've caused other people. Um, and therefore, why not make it a wonderful experience at the end for yourself? <laughs> and, 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 and it works. It's so simple. It's such a simple idea. And it works. And I've had people come here with not willing to do anything, lazy. And I've said to them, be as lazy as you want here. And give yourself time, but when you go back to your homes, you have to do something that is really going to be of benefit, not just to you, but your whole community and the world. And they've done that. And extraordinary things, you know, people are running refugee centres, they're changing the way that people work with um, people, indentured labourers, people are setting up schools for um, street children. I mean, I can just go on with the list of things people are doing. They've started businesses, and, but they've just seen what gives them joy and what they want to do, and that, to me, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. What does Asha mean again? So, I so know Asha, Asha and Druj, and yes, well, I was, about where they come I from. Yes, well, um, I'd always... My name is Zarbanu, and I'm always at the end of everybody's list. So I decided, <laughs> I said, I decided when we set up the charity that... I didn't want to name it after myself. I find it rather, rather tedious when people name things after themselves, yeah. as if they want to be remembered. So I thought I wanted an A, a word with beginning with A, so we'd be the top of everybody's list. Yeah. And I love, I love the word Asha because in many Indian languages it means hope. Um, but also from my Zoroastrian religion's viewpoint, Asha is is the highest attainment. It means divine justice. It means the righteous way. Um, and I think that's really important to, to know what is the, the right way that you should live um, and to acknowledge there is divine justice at the end of it all and yet to have hope. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a beautiful word. Mm. And um, I, think it's very, I think it's also important for people to ask you what it means because mm -hmm. then you get into a conversation with a person and I think conversations are very important. I don't think we have very much time for conversations with people. Um, people are so preoccupied with their own goings on yeah. um, and they very seldom actually listen to anybody else. 
because even when the person is talking, they're thinking what to answer. So they're not actually in that moment listening to the person, which I think is very important. Yeah, it's definitely a lost art mm -hmm. in, in the world at the <clears throat> moment, but hopefully one that's coming back. You know, we were talking earlier about how, um, you know, it's everything's got so fast and so many technologies and so many things that there, that there may be a, a drawback to some... I make everybody laugh their heads off because they don't believe I don't have a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't because I tell them I believe in telepathy. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants, I can feel if somebody's wanting to contact me and I contact them. Um, and I think we rely too much on mechanical things and things outside ourselves. And I think we should spend a little bit more time strengthening our own abilities to connect with people. Well, I experienced that with you yesterday because I said to Mark, I really want to meet your mother when she comes today. And then you just appeared next to me at the lunch table. <laughs> so, like, well, maybe, may, maybe the cosmos works in mysterious ways. Yeah. It's wonders to perform. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't need to send you a text message well, or Mark didn't need to send you a text message. It all just happened by itself. Well, I, I, I think if we, if we, I think as I get older and older and older, I realise that uh, we should trust the cosmos and trust the higher beings a little bit more mm -hmm. and um, understand that their timing is slightly different from ours, but they make it happen at the right time for, for the people that are meant to do things. And I think there's a lot of transition at the moment and there's a lot of drama going on all over the world. And I think that um, what I felt is that I, I do, I go to so many countries and speak to so many organizations and I meet so many remarkable light workers, you know, people doing the most extraordinary things all over the world, um, but they're not connected with each other. So they're doing it as one-offs. And if somebody could sort of bring them all together, the sort of uh, energy and lightness, it would be, it would be, oh, it would be dynamic. Um, and, and then I go and I see the dark forces mm -hmm. and they're always together. They're dark and, and they're powerful and, and, and they control things in a nasty way. Um, and they know how to work with each other mm -hmm. and they, they feed each other. Um, and I think the time has now come for, for the people around the world that are really doing remarkable things to just put everything aside and just come together. And that takes a, a lot of courage and it takes a lot of getting rid of ego and being able to say, well, we don't need to start another organization. We can coordinate, we can work together. So I think that's the next um, karmic step movement that we have to do. Yeah, and I, f I see it it's starting, even just what I'm here for this weekend is, is a small version mm. of that, 30 people coming together to, to pool our mm. resources and our work. Mm. Um, yes, but I, I, I see it in lots of places, and I love it when it happens at Asher. Mm. I love it, and um, I love the idea that people bring different energies to bear, but it's powerful. It's really powerful when they come together, and you can see it when they come forward with ideas that they want to do. And everybody says, yes, we're going to do it. Um, and the Asher Center didn't happen just because of me. It happened because a lot of people said, yes, we want this to happen, and they believed. And of course, we had to take on the forces of darkness, and, and I had to go to court, and I had to fight. And oh, when I look back on it, I think, could I do that again? And I think I, could, I was only able to do it because I was younger and I had a lot of physical and mental energy and a lot of will to make it happen. I, I, I wasn't willing to allow um, those in control to be negative mm -hmm. and, and um, be mistrustful. I mean, we are always asked, you know, if you go for, to people for funds, they always ask you, well, what is the outcome? And I, and I want to say to them, if I knew what the outcome was, it wouldn't be magical. It wouldn't be something that you want to do. If you know what the outcome is, it, it doesn't make sense. You know, you, you, you have to risk, you have to try new things. And, and maybe it'll be a failure, maybe. But if you know the kind of people that are, that are trying to make it happen 
and their backgrounds and what they have done, then you must trust that, that they know that it can be successful. And I think it's very important. Um, I think one of the things we don't do in politics is we don't ask politicians, what have you done? We ask them, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I can tell you I'm going to, you know, do everything. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the moon. But it's nonsense. Um, you see the quality, the character of the human being by what have they done in the past? Uh, uh, who are the people they mix with? You know, um, what is the energy that you get when you sit with them? What is their aura? What is their being? And we don't, we don't evaluate any of that. And I, I, think, um, I think that's where we've been misled. I mean, a lot of us don't know how to. Like, even just in my own journey, learning how to, how to do that stuff, how to understand an aura, how to tune yeah. in someone's energy, was not something that I was ever taught in any traditional way. I had to kind of go off and find my own, my own ways of learning these things to, to come, bring it back into my life. And it feels so sad that so, the way that we educate people... Well, I think society. the way we educate people is, is just sad. Mm. I mean, absolutely sad. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't put any value about enlightening their understanding of things. So they learn things, um, but they're not enlightened. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, so seldom do I ever hear about education that sort of enriches the character. You want people at the end of, of the educational process to be strong characters that can know that they can transform the world. And, and education sort of should enable young people to feel powerful, but it doesn't. It makes them feel powerless. You, and and uh, what sort of education is that? It doesn't, none of it makes sense to me. And I think it's really, really sad that, that well, I think my generation have to ask for forgiveness. I think what we have done to the world is really pathetic. It's ridiculous to think that we are still trying to feed young people with the idea that you want to have five minutes of fame, you want to be a celebrity. It's, you know, what, what does it mean? I mean, you know, I think about people who've been on television, who've been so famous, I can't even remember their names. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's just so temporary and so foolish. And instead of telling them that you've got to, that, you know, as I said before, there is a day of judgment, mm -hmm. and that is the, the most important examination. You'll sit, not essay exams, and, um, you know, you're burning karma and explain to them what is karma, and they should know that in the Bible it's also spoken about, you know, as you sow, so shall you reap, and if you sow misery and, and mistrust and you're violent towards other people and greedy, then the repercussions are endless, not, not just for our generation, but, for, you know, unto the seventh generation. Mm -hmm. And we're not taught any of these things. And, and, and it's so simple. I mean, you know, they make a big issue about how to live life. It's so, so simple. You know, just be kind to yourself, be kind to other people, be kind to the environment. I mean, it's, it's easy peasy, but you've just got to do it. And uh, we try to complicate things and we try to make it more difficult and, uh, so that people think we're very clever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, if you make it complicated, then everybody thinks that they should come to your courses or learn about it. But it's very simple. I mean, the great guru masters of old um, could have told scientists who have now researched, you know, world without end. And now they found it scientifically, but the gurus have been saying that. I mean, the great mystics, they know it all. And it's from lifetimes they know it. So it's actually quite simple. And then I feel so much time is wasted on trying to prove things, like that, you know, like whether it's sort of experiences of consciousness or I find that often you have conversations with people and you share something that you've experienced and it's like, well, that can't be true, da 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 da, da. And it, this, this, all that energy that goes into having to to show something rather than just being able to openly experience new things. Yes, that's, that's fascinating. It's because people are always having to prove themselves to other people. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody. Mm. And, and young pe people should be taught that. You don't have to prove yourself. 
You do what you instinctively know is right and good and bring joy to yourself and to others. Um, and we, we have made life so complicated. We made it so ugly. You know, you, you, you go to places and you know that the people who have built it or created it, you, you wonder what's the matter with them. I mean, I sometimes go to hospitals and they're all grey cement and they're the ugliest buildings in the city. And I think, well, when you want to get physically better and you go to a hospital, why isn't it beautiful? Why aren't there trees giving out that energy? Why aren't there beautiful plants? Um, you know, th there are all these art students around the world that would be over the moon to give their paintings to cover the walls. Mm. And instead it's all grey and miserable. Mm. And you wonder what psyche of the human being has created this? Who are these people? Mm. I mean, what's the matter with them? And why do we just accept that that is how it has to be? Well, I, I don't understand. I mean, I, I initially got involved in politics. I used to be the London organiser for Shelter, and then I got involved in politics because I thought that was the way to get change. And it, it was a mockery. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just a bunch of jokers as far as I'm concerned. Um, we desperately, I, I worked for years, 15 years, to ensure more women were in the political arena and they would bring a different politics to bear. And now there are more women. We've got a woman Prime Minister of Britain. The leader of the Scottish Parliament is a woman. Leader of the Welsh Parliament, Northern Ireland, all women. Um, the head of the Met is a woman. I mean, I just carry on. I mean, women have come into their own because the 21st century is about the feminine principle. but. I feel that it has been so difficult for them to get to those positions that when they've got there, they're just exhausted. Yeah. They're just exhausted. So the, the, the importance of the feminine principle taking over, and, uh, not taking over, balancing with the male principle, it still not happened. Yeah. Because it, everybody seems to be shattered. I, oh. I worked in Westminster and on, and for an MP and on, on various campaigns and... And it just, like, I, I literally couldn't quite believe who I was going to be asked to be in order to survive in that, in that place. And, and I just, eventually I was like, I don't want this. Like, I want to, I want to do something with my heart intact. <laughs> I, want to, I want to be allowed to envision something more beautiful than, mm. than this, not constantly just fighting against something. And I was reading your biography last night, and... You, you were the first Asian woman in British politics? No, I was, I was the first uh, councillor um, for the Liberal Party woman, non-white, mm -hmm. and I was also the first non-white to stand for Parliament, mm -hmm. which I did three times. And um, I remember when I, uh, when I first stood in 1982 and was elected in Harrow, I was told in no uncertain terms there was no way that any member of the British public would vote for a nation and a nation woman. And I said, why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if I do a good job, why shouldn't they vote for me? And I used to go campaigning with um, my younger son, um, Alex, we called Wags in a pushchair, and Mark, I used to pick Mark up from nursery school. And I got a 27% swing and I took the seat from Major Hassan, who was a conservative. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to stand against Cecil Parkinson, who was then the chairman of the Tory party in, in Hartsmere, and then became advisor to political leaders. And, and the whole thing snowballed because there were so few Asian women in politics. We were just, there, you know, and um, there was no doubt that um, they were very keen to at least have a token Asian woman. Um, but I, I, I feel that at least I articulated the views of a, of a community and I articulated the views of what it was like to be um, a mother. I mean, there was no mothers on the council. Uh, I was the only young woman, as well as being only non-white and all the rest of it, in a population of 28% Asians. Mm -hmm. um, but you were constantly fighting your own team. I mean, when I, when I first time I stood, uh, oh, sorry, the second time I stood for parliament, in Harrow, um, my own party, the Liberals, um, refused to campaign with me. So we had to start a whole campaigning committee, the whole thing all over again. And, you know, it, 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 
you're fighting your own people. It was so nasty. And so all the energies went into a waste of time. It was a complete waste of time. Your energies went into negating other people's um, negativity and um, sort of um, hatred of, of other people that didn't, you know, weren't like them. And I just felt there was other things I could do. And then uh, politics, in a sense, was very helpful because I learned public speaking. I learned how to do press release. I learned how to chair committees. Um, I, I, I learned how you operate with not just politicians, but with officers, mm -hmm. you know, with the civil service. Um, but I, I didn't see the change happening that I wanted. And I thought... I was on a television program and I was challenged to write a book on, I was just, uh, Benazir Bhutto just become um, Prime Minister of Pakistan and I was on a chat show and they were carrying on about Asian women being doormats and all they did was cook curries all day. And um, I was quite offended. And uh, I was challenged on television to write about women that weren't like that. And so I took the challenge on television. I'd never written a book. And I always believe you should just do things. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be an expert. Just do it and learn on the job. Mm -hmm. uh, like I learned on the job with politics. I was just a young housewife, but I knew that if I knocked on doors and spoke to people, they would trust me. I mean, I knew their problems if, they, if I listened to them. So I wrote the book and I met over 100 Asian women from around the world. And it showed me that there had been a diaspora because of the British Empire. And then I learned that, you know, that that one of the greatest um, heroines of the Second World War was Noor Inyad Khan, who was a radio operator and, and had been caught by the Nazis and um, had been killed in Dachau. And there's only four people's names up in Dachau, and she's one of them. And there, you know, she was a Muslim. Mm. Her father was the head of the Sufi society. That the first woman to study law in Britain was Cornelia Sorabji, who studied in Oxford, and a lovely story about when she was doing her law exam, they had to put a curtain between her and the men so she didn't distract the men while they were doing their exams. And the first woman physician was Dorsa Bai Patel. So, you know, I, 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 I'd been brought up in Britain and I'd studied history and I didn't know anything about my own heritage mm -hmm. and, the, and the contribution we'd made to, to Britain. And I felt really proud about it and also the extraordinary uh, modern Asian women. And then that led me on to um, lots of other things. I, I, I did, became involved in many, many um, organizations and charities where I was asked to be patron. Um, and then I became uh, the director of Anti-Slavery International, which is the oldest human rights organization in the world. And um, that led to me going around the world and um, being involved in organizations that looked at the way people were treated at the bottom level and that, you know, um, trying to make people aware that how we trade with other people, you know, if we want to buy cheap carpets, then at the bottom of the line, the people who are making the carpet are going to, you know, be discriminated against and there's so much greed. So, you know, young children are sitting, not having an education, being put in rooms, sitting next to each other like battery hens, making carpets, so we can buy them cheaply. Mm -hmm. You know, if we want to, there should be fair trade. If we want to buy things, then we should make sure that the whole system, right down to the bottom person, people are treated properly and we pay the right price. Yeah. Um, I was involved with setting up homes for street children. All sorts of wonderful things happened because, um, I understood how the system worked through politics. That's very important. And also, um, I'd met so many people in all the political parties and been involved in so many organizations, especially in the women's movement. I'd been so involved in that all over the world that I was able to ring people up and doors would open. So things would happen quicker than for a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And that was, so the political experience was important for that reason. But I just look at, I look at the scandals that go on now and I just, I don't even want to listen to it. It's just pathetic. I mean, you know, this sort of molestering people that are 
don't have the same power as you just for sexual gratification is is, is, is sort of is pathetic. You know, I don't want to be involved with it. Uh, I, I, I find it remarkable that, you know, England goes around the world talking about democracy. Um, and then you have a, a second chamber, the House of Lords in England, that nobody's elected. Mm -hmm. I mean, how is that democratic? And what I find deeply offensive is that, you know, you, you have scandals, people are put in prison, they go to prison, they come back, and then they're legislating for us. I mean, it seems to me ridiculous. So all this is going on, and people in power just turn a blind eye because it's easier to let it go on than to change it. Change is difficult. It takes, it takes a, a sense of knowing what your priorities are, and it takes a, immense moral courage, and we don't have very much of that in the modern world, to say, this is not acceptable, Everybody knows it's not acceptable, and we demand a change. But what happens is people, when you tell them, they say, oh, isn't that terrible? But we can't change it, we can't do anything, and it's forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so it just carries on. I mean, it strikes me that you have so much courage and so much like moral courage. And you know, as I was reading about your story, and you know, some of the, even the, the racist experiences that put you and your family mm -hmm. in, di in danger, mm -hmm. And yet you still were able to, to keep kind of coming out, fighting against what was bad, shining a light on what needed to be shone on and, and continuing with your work. Where do you get that from? Well, I, I remember very clearly, and it's not in my autobiography, but I remember clearly now you're talking, um, the sheer horror of the hatred towards me. Mm. I, rem I remember being on Question Time and I was sitting next to the then Home Secretary, Kenneth Baker. That just shows you how long ago it was. <laughs> and, um, and the other side of me was um, the ex-president of Ireland, Fitzgerald, and Claire Short was, on, was the fourth person. And I remember that they had so many telephone calls during and after the, uh, after the program, objecting to a blackie sitting next to the Home Secretary. Mm -hmm. And the, the immense hatred, we had break-ins, the car was broken into, um, there was death threats against the boys. So as I was campaigning in Hart, Hartsmere, I'd have to go back home to pick up the boys from school, settle them at home with whoever was uh, there, Richard or my mother or friends, and then go back campaigning. But I was absolutely determined to do it. And I remember um, there was a policeman, I was sitting on the police committee, and he said to me, um, if, it's, if it's too hot in the kitchen for you, Mrs. Gifford, why don't you get out? And I remember, I remember <laughs> answering him and saying, then who would do the cooking? <laughs> and he looked at me, he was very shocked because uh, I just felt it was very, very important that it didn't matter what happened to me, but that I was visible and audible and these really sort of nasty racists, sort of mindless thugs, realized that they couldn't change um, what was happening in the world. And I knew that in my generation, we would have a, a lot of Asian women taking high positions in politics and public life and in all jobs. And I knew it would just take time. They would come through the educational system and they would be there. Mm. And I used to laugh to myself that, you know, the West was... was um, opened up and a lot of people were scalped and I was one of the people who were scalped mm -hmm. on en route and it wasn't nice and I often think would I go through that again and I wonder whether what the uh, I wonder I don't know well luckily you don't have to I don't have to <laughs> you've, you've not done interested it. <laughs> in the sli slightest in doing it not interested um and there's so many ways you, you, can, you can change people by legislation and politics. You can change people by writing. And I do a lot of writing and, then you, and, and speaking. So I, I go to a lot of schools and universities and all over the world. I mean, next week I'm going to Dublin for the um, University Essay Awards, Global Awards. And I'm speaking about one of my heroes, Thomas Clarkson, mm -hmm. who won an essay prize at Cambridge in uh, 1782 and then went on to really be the driving force behind the abolition movement in Britain. Um, and when you think about people like that who are sort of written out of our history uh, and, and we're taught only about 
people who build empires and, you know, people who make it rich and, and who are powerful. And really, there's so many inspirational people in our own collective history. And we've just write them out of, write them out of the story. And I, I feel one of the things I love doing is writing about people that I feel really have been forgotten and we shouldn't forget them because mm -hmm. they're so such wonderful people um, in the same way you know the first I mean we carry on about first Asians but you know in 1892 we had the first Asian member of parliament in Britain Dada by Nauruji and I wrote his biography and he was an inspiration to me I mean you know a hundred years before me he was in parliament you know, and we've completely forgotten him. He, he's been written out of, written out of our, our, our collective memory. So it's very, I, I think that's important. And then I suppose the, the final thing um, to transform the world is, uh, as we all know, to transform ourselves and be there as, as an example to other people. Mm -hmm. So they can, they can actually see that they can, do, they can make it happen. It's not impossible. Everything's very possible. I mean, everything is possible, and it's all happening so quickly at the moment. So we see people making a lot of money and doing some fantastic things, and that if that same energy was put into insuring, for example, you know, we have um, 200 million slaves in the world still today, and it is estimated it takes about 12 billion pounds to release every slave, educate them, and put them into some sort of employment... And I remember when I was told that, I went, oh, you know, who would have the, who would have the courage to try and go to people and, 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 and get 12 billion? And then I thought about it. Well, you know, how many billions have we spent in, in, in bailing out banks? I mean, just the Bank of Ireland was 64 billion. And God knows, in Bank of Scotland and um, Lloyd's and all the rest of it. I mean... Um, we spent 36 billion on Trident, and I don't know how many on the missiles, um, you know, to mass murder people. Um, if every sportsman on one day, on a Saturday, every footballer decided that they wouldn't take their wages, and if that alone would solve the problem, if, if we just stopped gambling on horses and on cricket for one day, yeah. We'd have the money, but there's no, there's no will, there's no priority. Yeah. But, I mean, if we could have some more Clarksons that would go around the world saying to people, it can be done, it can be done in 24 hours if you have the will to do it. Uh, and it's so simple. I mean, you know, I see these ugly buildings. I used to be London organiser for Shelton, and I really love beautiful buildings. I, I think in some past life I must have been an architect mm -hmm. or a, 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 a garden designer. And I think there's so many ugly buildings and it's so simple to make them beautiful. You put some trees, you put boxes of flowers, you put beautiful paintings in the corridors. Get good lighting. Yeah, and you, 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 know, you give pre people pride in their environment and then they look after it. I remember when we first came to uh, the Asher Centre, it was very derelict, the building. And... The garden land was uh, infill, and we had to clean it out and relay the garden. We put 40, we got um, 40,000 roses, old English roses, and we got 40,000 tulips just in the front bit where all the rubbish was put. And we had to do, we had to do work on the, uh, on the Asher Centre itself. It needed a lot of uh, cleansing. Um, but we did it, and a lot of spiritual people came um, and put their energies into the centre and made it what it is. And um, it just needs, it needs thought. It needs thought, and it needs um, a sense of beauty. And it can mm. be done, and, and it can be done to every building. And, and when we first came, I remember the first group didn't really treat the centre very well. Um, but when we had done it up, um, the whole energy of the place changed and the way people treated it, they treated it with respect and, and they understood that when we gave them biodynamic food, which was fresh from the garden, and we thought about what that we were feeding them, it had an impact on their lives. <laughs> 
talked earlier about mental and um, physical energy and how that is what we need to keep going. What do you do to keep and maintain yours? What have you done throughout your life? Nothing. Um, I know that I should do more yoga, deep breathing, meditation, mindfulness, walking in the forest, but I'm just hopeless. So. But yeah, you've, you've been blessed with... I've been blessed with um, a robustness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've got, I'm, I'm lucky, I've got physical and mental energy. Mm -hmm. But I do get tired, I am mortal, and um, it's very, very important, I think, to have a balanced life. And I've only understood that very late in life. I wish I'd been taught all that when I was young. Mm. And I think it's, uh, I think every child should be taught um, in school and by their parents um, the importance of meditation and the importance of yoga and the importance of, of how to breathe properly. Most people don't even know how to breathe. Uh, and I think those are just basic things one should have in one's education. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could have done all the things that you had done if you were living a balanced life? No, absolutely not, of so course there's not. A, so there's a, there's of course, you a, have to a be... balance in the balance. Uh, oh, of course. I mean, um, um, you have to have a little bit of craziness. I, 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 one of my favorite books is um, Zobra the Greek by mm -hmm. Cousin Zarkis. And at the end, um, it, it's, it's very telling. The Zorba, the Greek, uh, says to the Englishman, um, uh, boss, you English, you have everything, but you don't have madness. A little madness is very important. Just, that, just a teeny bit of it in, in the whole magical ingredients, because without that, everything is too logical and everything um, should go from A, B, C, D and E. And sometimes things can go from A to Z. You, you don't actually have to go through the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's only possible if you, you have that sense of craziness and wickedness and, and risk-taking and um, sort of a belief that it's meant to be and just trusting. Um, and sometimes you don't even have to trust. You just do it by instinct. You know, this is the right thing to do and you're just going to do it. And as I said to you before, um, uh, everything I did, I just, people asked me to do it, and I said yes. Um, and I just did it. So uh, sometimes you just have to trust that when somebody asks you or the universe puts you in a certain place, there is a reason, and there's a reason why you meet certain people. Often I've met so many people, and I thought, what have I met them for? What was the point of it? And maybe um, you don't do something with them, but y you meet them and they introduce you to somebody else or, or there's a reason. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it can take 20 years, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, you know, uh, why, why so long? It, it's not instant, but there's always some sort of tie up and some reason. And that's why I, I always take the opportunities life gives me because I think that there's always a reason that I've been asked to do something. So uh, that's my, my uh, way of behaving. But it might, it might not be suitable for other people. Other people might find it foolish to behave mm. like that. Well, but it just suits my character. Yes, we each have to discover our own character. Yes, of course. And I mean, then work with it. Absolutely. I mean, my character's like that. I'm, I'm you know, I'm feisty. I'm full of life. So I, I, I like taking life on. It's a challenge. I, I like to sort of, I like to defy what people's expectations of me should be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be stereotyped by people. I don't want to be told I'm a nation woman or I'm a granny or, you know, whatever it is. Um, that's all nonsense as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. well, um, talking about A to Z, can you share um, about what your name means? Yes, my name Zarbanu means Lady of Gold. And um, I was named after my grandmother who died uh, before I was born. And in our Zoroastrian tradition, uh, we always name uh, our children after people in the family who died in respect to them. And um, I remember when I went into politics, nobody could pronounce my name. And everybody said, 
oh, you know, um, it's going to be a great disadvantage to you. So I thought, well, what can I do? So um, I used to tell everybody immediately my name meant Lady of Gold. And I remember in, in a very Jewish area, I used to say to everybody, you can call me Goldie. <laughs> and, and, and they used to just laugh and loved it. So everybody remembered who I was. So, you know, everybody can say something's a disadvantage and then you can turn it around and make it an advantage. Mm -hmm. It's how you look at it. So to me, it was a great advantage. Yeah, and instead of being upset that people couldn't understand your name, you just you found oh well. A I mean, I did. I remember writing an article. I used to write a political article um, every month, and I remember um, I once got a letter from um, an archbishop who addressed the envelope as Zebra Gifford. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I was speaking at um, St. Martin's in the Field, and they invited me. So I wrote an article because it made me laugh because I had been called everything from Sabrina to Zanzibar to Zed to Zebi to Zebi to Zebedee, um, and now to be called Zebra. And I wrote at the end of the article and said that was the, the most classic of the names that I was called because even though I believed in black and whites getting on together, I wasn't a Zebra. <laughs> But, um, you know, I just say to people, call me Zed, call me what you want. I mean, what's a name, you know? Yeah. Anything. Um, and, it, you know, it's it just, I mean, the Gujarati Indians call me Jarabanu because in their language, they don't have a Z. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, it's J, so Jarabanu. And it's so sweet when my husband wants to be very sweet towards me. He always says Jarabanu and we all start <laughs> laughing. So, you know, you you've got to be a little bit laid back. Yeah. I mean, some people get deeply offended when you can't um, uh, pronounce their names. And, well, honestly, life is too short for all that. Yeah. How you, so you grew up in England, but you would spend your summers in... India. In, in India, in Calcutta. Uh, no, in, in, in Pune. In Pune. Pune. Ah, nice. And my grandmother was there. I was born in Calcutta because, um, by our tradition... Um, your first child, uh, you go, the, uh, the mother goes back to her parents. Mm -hmm. So my mother went um, to Calcutta to have me, to her father. My grandmother, of course, was dead then. And um, so I was born in Calcutta. And I love to say I'm a, a Bengali Babu. I, I'm, I think the Bengalis are probably the most brilliant people in the world. So <laughs> I was very, very happy. And they say all the great spiritual leaders come from, from uh, Bengal. So I was very proud to be born there. But I was really... Um, uh, I was brought up my early years um, in Pune, uh, which is now Pune, um, by my grandmother, uh, because my parents had come to London to see whether they could start a new life. Mm -hmm. And then I joined them when I was three and a half. And uh, because they worked so hard in the family hotel, in the summer holidays, I used to go back to my granny in, in, in India. So I had this great love for India, great love. Um, which my brothers and sisters don't have. They were all born in Britain, and, and they have, it's a different dynamics. Mm -hmm. I think where you're born is important. Mm. There is some bond. Yeah, but then for me, I've also found, you know, being born in Britain, Indian parents, that until I... I didn't really realise how Indian I was until, you, you know, there. my late 20s, early 30s. Then we would go to India, but I would feel quite separate because um, I was in English boarding school, you know, trying yes. to make it in, in, in a particular kind of society. And, you know, I think when, you, when you're young and there's something different about you, a lot of your energy goes into trying to fit in. And then it, it wasn't until, I guess, my sort of mid to late 20s that I, I just opened up a real exploration to, like, what does having an Indian soul mean? And then I discovered just a whole, a whole lot of things about myself and found a whole new level of comfort with myself from being able to integrate those two worlds mm. um, in a deep and meaningful way to, my, to, to me. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I'm always fascinated by people that have lots of different cultures as part of who they are and how they, how they integrate those. Mm. Well, I, I see my soul very much as a Zoroastrian, um, and I think it's in my DNA. I mean, I can't help um, really fight injustice. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's what we're about, and um, enjoying life. 
sort of cherishing life. That's what the religion's about. Uh, and I, but I have a deep respect for Indian, um, more than culture, Indian sort of um, whole sense of being. I mean, I think India's, um, the way that they welcomed, especially the Gujaratis, welcomed my ancestors to India. Are we Gujarati, my family? Yes. Oh, well, the way that we were, we were welcomed and, and allowed to flourish. And because of that, we contributed. And, and there's a beautiful story that when um, my ancestors arrived as refugees in India, um, they were taken in front of the Gujarati um, Rana, and he explained to them um, that they couldn't take any more immigrants. The country was full. And he had a, a glass of milk bought, and it was full right up to the top. And he said, we just, we, we can't accept immigrants and refugees. And the Zoroastrian high priest called for a little bit of sugar, and he put it in very carefully. So it just melted into the milk. And he said, we'll be like the sugar. We will sweeten your country. Mm. Um, and because of the wisdom of both men, the community, you know, have, has contributed beyond its numbers. I mean, its numbers are nothing. I think there's about 60,000 in India, but, you know, the Tata is the largest industrial house in India and in um, Britain, uh, uh, Zoroastrians. Um, the first three members of parliament, non-white, were um, Zoroastrian Asians, Dadabai Nauruji, as I spoke about in 1892, then uh, Sabaw and Agri in 1895, he was a Tory. And then um, Shapuji Saklavala in the 20s and 30s, he was both first um, a communist and then a Labour MP. Um, you know, it, it, to me, the contribution, and of course everybody knows Freddie Mercury, and he was a Zoroastrian. Um, in India, um, they're, they're highly respected, they're professionals and business people. And I remember when I used to go campaigning, any Asian door that I knocked on and they asked me who I was and I said, a Zoroastrian Parsi, they would just say, oh, we had wonderful friends, what a wonderful community, they're so generous, so big hearted. And it, I just felt so good. And um, my whole being is Zoroastrian, I can't help myself. Mm -hmm. And I just, I do love my community. I think they're wonderful. Mm. There's so many more things that I want to talk to you about. <laughs> um, um, yeah, from like your near-death experiences to some of just the... Well, the, the near-death experience was very, uh, very, it was a very important um, turning point in my life because um, I, had, I, uh, I have a bleeding complaint. Um, uh, my grandmother died of bleeding. It's called thrombocytopenia and it's very, very rare. And um, when I went to see my eldest son um, doing fencing at university, I started hemorrhaging and um, we managed to get to the Royal Free and we were told that there was nothing they could do. Uh, I was a registered bleeder there and uh, that I should go home and die in peace. And um, it, it was weird, they, it was a Saturday night and there were so many alcoholics in, in, in um, A&E, we couldn't get, they couldn't find a bed. And then um, a nurse turned up and she said to my mother, is this Zabanu Gifford? And my mother started laughing. And she said, there's no other Zabanu Gifford in the world. It's the only one. And, and, and she managed to get a bed and they managed to get some blood that didn't match my blood, but was uh, helicoptered in from Birmingham. Um, and during that period, um, the doctors were convinced that I was dead because my hemoglobin had gone below three. And uh, I had a near-death experience and it was, I, I can still feel it. I was in a chariot uh, surrounded by this extraordinary light. It was golden light. And um, I think it was Krishna behind me, but we were going into battle. And I said, I just want to die. I want to die in peace. And I remember him just holding me up and saying, but you haven't gone into battle yet. You have to go into battle. And, um, and then I came, came back. They gave me the blood and I, my hemoglobin went up. But at the same time as this was happening, you might think that it was 
just, um, you know, it was something that was happening in my mind. But a, a psychiatrist friend of ours rang my sister Jeannie and said, um, what's happened to Zabanu? I, I seeing her in a chariot and she's going into battle and I see this great light and she's in the presence of Lord Krishna. Now, I'm not a Hindu and he's not a Hindu, but he, and that was exactly, my sister said exactly at the same time as I was coming back into life. Oh. And, and, I, and I realized there was a reason that um, I was allowed to live, even though I wanted to die. And it was many years before I realized what really I had to do in life. So often I would, you know, I was ill for, very, for a very long time after that. And I'd often think, you know, um, why have I been saved? What have I got to do? And again, you have to learn patience and you have to learn trust that there is a reason and the right thing will happen that you have to do. And of course, it was the setting up of the Asher Center, but it was a turning point in my life. And it was also a point, I was so weak that I couldn't go back into politics. Mm. And it was wonderful because I then didn't have to make the decision. This is, it was made for me by the higher beings, that that wasn't the path I was supposed to be on. So in, in many ways, um, it was the most important thing that happened to me. Thank you for sharing. I've got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Do you tell that story? Wow. Well, I, yeah, thank you so much for your time and this Pleasure. interview. Pleasure. And also, you know, I know we don't want to be in boxes, but as a young Asian woman, and I've tried not to have the label, but it's there and it's put on me. I, like, I, I know that the, the things that I get to do in my life are a direct result of things that you did and, and, oh, and opening and paving the way and, you know, having to deal with more, more aggression in, in say, in, in racism. It's changed a lot throughout my life. Oh, I mean, in, in, in a generation, I mean, you know, I'm a different generation from you all, but in a generation, anything is possible. Yeah. I mean, and I remember um, a very sweet politician. Um, uh, I remember um, he opened the door for me and I said, thank you so much. And he said, um, it's such a pleasure to open the door for a woman. And I just started laughing because um, at that period of history, a lot of women didn't like doors open for them. They thought it was a bit sexist. Uh -huh. So I, we both understood and we both started giggling. And he said, so many doors have been closed to women. He said, it's such a pleasure to open one for you. And I thought, what a lovely thing to say. Yeah. And what a nice thing to do, open doors for other people. Yeah. You know, to make it happen for them. Um, and, and to be able to throw that energy into the universe and say, I'm doing, that's what I'm here to do. And it's lovely, and uh, uh, life's been a pleasure. <laughs> life's, <laughs> life's been fun. Life's been, li I've had a very uh, dramatic, fun life. I've done everything, I've gone everywhere, I've met everybody. I've been blessed by the most extraordinary evolved souls in the world. Um, they've come at the right time, and they've, they've done the right thing for me and looked after me, and I've just been so fortunate. The gods have been very good to me. Mm. And why shouldn't I be good to other people when they've been so good to me? Thank you. Well, I um, want to say to all our friends listening, do come and visit the Asher Centre. It'll be um, lovely. It's in Gloucestershire, and you can look us up on the web. It's A-S-H-A, it's Centre, and you're all welcome. And it's also said to be the forest where Tolkien would come for his summers, and Lord of the Rings yes. is inspired by it. It's very a magical here. Yeah. Absolutely, and we have uh, we have a Hobbiton, which I created. I'd, I I was a guest speaker in Auckland at a conference, a youth conference, and I went and saw where they made the movie. And so when I came back, we created a Hobbiton for, for children here as well. I, did, I popped in earlier. <laughs> I'm still to sleep in, in the little house. I've never <laughs> slept there overnight, but I know children have. And it's, it's very beautiful. And also, J.K. Rowling's um, spent some of her childhood here, was inspired. Mm. It's very magical, the Forest of Dean. Very few people know about it. Mm. I remember when I first came, I'd never heard of the Forest of Dean. But there is something here. And it just shows one of those things where you wanted to 
set this up in London and it, it happened here. And I, I mean, what a gift. How, and how many, how many places I went to, how many planning meetings all over Britain. I wanted it so much in London. And yet the, the higher beings knew what was the right place and they'd already marked it out. Mm -hmm. And why I even worried, goodness knows. So we just need to listen more. We just need patient. to believe that it's all unfolding at the right time. Uh, for everybody and um, just go with the flow and also with a sense of adventure and a sense of adventure possible. and 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 knowing and knowing that and I think I've learned this late in life that you have a destiny and things are written for you there's no doubt about that but you also have free will mm. and you can defy your destiny you can do anything Mm. So you can have a great soul, even if your astrology doesn't say so. You can do anything. You're allowed. You're allowed to change the game. Mm -hmm. And you have to rise up to it as well. You have to rise up to it and you have to, you have to enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then you don't bring, you don't bring pleasure and joy to other people. Uh, it's not a burden. Life, life is, um, life's a nice learning curve. It's fun. Um, and it's there for you to burn karma and to create good karma for yourself and to those around you. And knowing that whatever you do, you're going to have to come back and experience it. So you might as well make it really nice. <laughs> That's my <laughs> advice to you all. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible by you, our community. If you loved this and would like to contribute to our Patreon campaign or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes so we can grow. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together.